Good morning, everybody. Um, and welcome to today's first spotlight session. Uh, we have to get started because our speaker only has half an hour and we have to keep ourselves to the schedule. The next one will be at uh, 1230. So I would like to present to you uh, Martin Dugiamas, uh, who's the, the founder and CEO of the uh, open source project Moodle. Uh, he works with uh, 80 uh, software developers and educators. Uh, he's responsible for this uh, wonderful project, uh, Moodle, and uh, uh, as the, the Moodle Classroom and Mobile. And uh, he has uh, multiple uh, uh, postgraduate uh, degrees from uh, computer sciences and education. And his research focus is how to uh, help, how, how technology can help uh, improve teaching and learning in open and human ways and how that can contribute to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. And without further ado, I would like to ask Martin to uh, start his session. If you're tweeting, his uh, ID is at Moodler, so please tag him in your post. Thank you. Thank you, Ildiko. That was really fantastic. Thanks for showing up as well. Uh, it's really nice to see all these faces here. I, I know some of these faces too. Um, it's been nine years since I was at OEB. Um, I hope you apologize for this title. It's a little bit clickbaity, but um, it is also uh, deadly serious. Um, and I, I want to talk about a lot of things today, and uh, I'll get started. So I, I want to cover very quickly, I'm going to just talk about me, about Moodle, if you're not familiar. Who here uses Moodle? Can I have some hands? Okay, it's about half of you. Uh, I want to talk about the big problems that we are facing um, on this planet. I want to talk about examining solutions and how I'm looking at the solutions and, and what Moodle is doing from already now and for the next years to come. And hopefully that's interesting to you uh, as, as one example of a project on this planet. So a little bit about me. Here's a, a little bit of myself and the, the Moodle team. This is um, in Barcelona. We've just opened a, an office in Barcelona this year. We now have 20 people there looking down on Las Ramblas in a, in a beautiful location, and that's growing rapidly. Uh, the main office is in Perth in Western Australia, which is why I have this accent. Um, and I grew up in the middle of Australia, in the desert. Uh, this, is what, this is what my backyard looked like. This is what the, the town where I grew up in, what it looks like. Um, it was an Aboriginal community, and I was the only non-Aboriginal child in that uh, town. My, uh, to get there, you could drive for three days, or you could uh, take a little aeroplane like this. And my classroom was about the size of Spain. Uh, so I, I did distance education until I was 12 on what we called School of the Air. Uh, this school just turned 100 years old uh, a couple of weeks ago and is one of the oldest distance education schools in the world. In the beginning, uh, it was on horses and postal delivery of correspondence. Uh, when I was doing it, it was shortwave radio, uh, which was the, the best technology at the time, to communicate over a thousand kilometers away. Uh, now they use internet through satellites and they use Moodle and uh, it's a nice thing. So about Moodle, Moodle's an, it's an open source learning management system. Uh, the first release that I put on the internet that I had developed completely myself uh, was 2001 and it's now used um, all over the world. So here's a few logos. It's used in the higher education space um, quite heavily. Uh, it's used by corporates a lot, and that's not something uh, everybody knows about. Um, but a lot of big names use Moodle for various projects. It's used in the NGO sector and the IGO sector for development projects as well. Uh, and this is an area that's... Um, particularly interesting to us and to me right now and something I'm going to be talking about. Um, just yesterday I discovered uh, that there was a, a site, it's just in, they have a booth and they're right here at the front, they have a, uh, this is the European Commission and they have a Devco Academy and I didn't know about it until I just randomly ran into them 
uh, yesterday here at the conference. And that's typical, actually. People take Moodle, they use it for, for amazing things. Um, I found out the World Bank has been using Moodle for 10 years. Almost every development project they do has an education component and they use Moodle. I found this out two months ago. So it is used um, very, very globally. You can see a sharp concentration in this part of the world. Um, but um, the, the total numbers are only a suggestion. We ask people to press a registration button in the software, and very few do. We estimate around a tenth of the people who do. So the people who do, have you registered, by the way? Oh, good, thank you. Um, the people who do, there's about 107,000 sites, uh, all countries, uh, a lot of users, 145 million. There's 1.2 billion quiz questions. Uh, it's a, it's a quite a big thing. A few months ago, there was uh, some a study done by the Feldstein's blog, uh, List Ed Tech, and they um, their stats said Moodle was about 60% of higher education in the world was was using Moodle. Uh, and in many countries I go to, like Uruguay, they tell me 100%. You know, Mexico is like 95%. Um, very high numbers in some countries. So we have a lot of responsibility in this project. And I want to talk to you now about the foundation of what's going forward. So we have a very clear mission, and I think anyone who has an, any sort of organization should really focus on their mission. Our mission is empowering educators to improve our world. We are very specifically focused on educators, not AI, not direct to students. We're focused on helping the educational structures that are already there. Because there's seven and a half billion people in the world, and I don't really think we need to be replacing them all um, t that quickly. Uh, teaching each other is an essentially human thing. Secondly, our vision, we're trying to build the most effective platform for learning. Notice we don't have open in here necessarily. It just turns out open is the way to do it. But what we're trying to do is just make the most effective way of learning. And we have five key values. And values are essential in any project. It's just, unfortunately, values tend to be buried on the About Us page on the corporate website somewhere. Um, and they're not up front. Our values are what enables people to operate around our project. The tens and hundreds of thousands of people who contribute or are part of our project Ultimately, it comes down to the values of the project. So education is a value for us. We try and uh, be aware and be mindful of the fact that education is a component of every single interaction you have, every meeting, every time you, you, you talk to somebody face to face, every time you're in a situation like this, there's an education component. Um, and that's something we've got to keep in mind. Um, we have a value of openness, of course. We strive to be open in our goals. I'm going to tell you about. We're open in our tools and our processes. We try and let everybody in the project communicate freely. We practice respect of not only um, uh, the people inside the Moodle community, but competitors. Uh, all aspects. Anyone else doing things in education deserves respect. Everyone deserves respect. Um, and, uh, and, and that sort of sensitivity to what other people are doing. Integrity is essential. Following through on what you do, doing what you say, saying what you do, uh, being honest and fair, these are the kinds of values that keep uh, a large project uh, operating and being together, and sadly, something that, that you don't see all the time. Uh, and lastly, innovation. The, the project is set up to allow innovation. I just pointed an example of some innovation happening in the European Commission here. Um, they were enabled by using Moodle to, to do innovative work. And every Moodle site allows that. And uh, there's many other um, aspects around it. So let's talk about the big problems. The UN has very kindly gone through a very long and detailed process of putting together the, uh, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. 
And this is the closest thing that this planet has to a, a road map of, of things we should be focusing on. Is anybody here, is this, for anybody here, is this the first time you've ever seen this picture? Anybody? A few? Okay, this is fantastic. So I think this should be in almost every single presentation because this talks about the big issues that all human activity actually should probably be focused on helping in some way. Um, that pretty diagram, it's very pretty and colourful, but it summarises a lot of pain and angst and horrible things that are happening. So here's some pictures of inequality, uh, here's some picture of a something, an area affected by climate change, uh, the refugee problem, 65 million plus people without a country, the, the damage we're doing to the environment uh, globally. They're, they're things you all know about, you all have heard of them, but you don't encounter them day to day. They're somewhere else usually especially the, all of us here are very lucky to, almost everyone here lives in the uh, quite wealthy parts of the world, I suspect. So these 17 things are, are uh, critical for us as a planet to focus on. Number four is very specifically related to this conference, the OEB and, and, and all the education work that you are doing. Um, we should be thinking about quality education, not just basic education, not just the ability to read and write, although that's important, um, but a quality education. It turns out, I think, quality education is what drives all of these 17. You need quality education to attack uh, inequality, to, to, uh, to, to tackle the environment, to tackle sustainable cities. So. What are the solutions? What, what, can, uh, what can we do? And put yourself in my shoes of being uh, in the centre of this, this Moodle project and all the users and the things that are happening. What, how can we leverage, how can we bring together that community to help solve some of these problems? What are the sort of solutions? What we need is long-term thinking here. And a lot of times you, you don't hear that. You don't hear people using 50, 100, 1,000 year time frames. You hear people talking in very, very short term thinking. But we need long term thinking because it's short term thinking that got us into the mess that we are in now. What I think we should be trying to create is a future where the next generations, plural, are globally oriented, multiculturally aware, environmentalist, caring, empathetic, if you like, citizens. People who believe they are part of the whole and that they are some part of the problem and some part of the solution. If we had a full generation that was like that, I think we, a lot of these problems would go away, the ones on those 17. Uh, can we rely on our governments to give us that generation of people? Well, you know, I love governments as much as you do. Um, governments have a big part to play. In many parts of the world, though, there's corruption or there's very short-term thinking. Uh, you know, they're always focused on the next elections. They always have to think about elections. And um, unfortunately, that leads to a lot of short-term policy. I actually like the kinds of things that I hear here in Europe more than in most parts of the world, actually. There's a bit more long-term thinking, which is um, why I'm moving to Europe next year. I'm going to move to Barcelona from Perth. But they don't have all the solutions. Do, do profit-focused businesses have the solutions? I would argue profit-focused businesses, while you know, capitalism works to an extent, it can go wrong. Profit is excess money. You have an operation, you want to get something done, great. You need money, you need things to keep it turning, people need to be paid. But if you're focused on the extra money, if you're focused on reducing what you're spending so that you can get more cash off the cash machine, that leads people into decisions that are not good for the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. You have, pe you have greed taking over, you have companies collapsing, you have um, infrastructure failing, you have all kinds of issues. So while they are 
definitely part of the solution. They're not enough. Are NGOs the solution? Well, we're getting closer. I think NGOs have, um, they're not profit focused. They are definitely caring about what needs to happen. But they too need support and infrastructure. They, they cannot alone, in a project based kind of thinking, attack long term solutions all the time. There needs to be more. Are standards the answer? Can we set global standards? Well, you know the old joke. You know, I saw 14 standards, so I, I came up with a new standard to bind them all together, and now we have 15 standards. Um, that's the beauty of standards. Everyone can make a new one. And standards are important, right? We are in a, we're in a place surrounded by electricity and water that is the result of standards set many, many years ago. We don't think about it anymore, but wherever you go in the world, you plug in your devices, you get electricity. It's amazing, absolutely amazing. And that's infrastructure, and standards are a big part of it. But standards alone do not implement themselves. You need something to, you need someone to lay those cables and put those plugs in the wall and build the power stations and do all that to make electricity actually be something we can use. So I believe that the best thing that I can see is open technology. Open technology uh, is the kind of the missing piece that lets those things work together and lets us build something for long-term thinking. It jumped back by itself. And open education builds on top of that, and I'll get to that first, but second. First I want to talk about open technology. This is what I mean when I say open technology. It's not just simply open source. Open technology, yes, it means you can customize it and you can localize it. If we're going to be a multicultural world, uh, and I fully believe we should be, I, I, that's, that's one thing that gets me about uh, very big companies that want to go straight to students and bypass education systems, is you have this kind of cultural imperialism, right? They're saying, well, you know, do it in English. Uh, do it this way, use this mindset. No, open technology has to be open enough that you can bend it to what you, what, what, what you need locally. You should be able to choose your service provider. You shouldn't be locked in to services from one company because that way you start having monopolies, you start having abuse, you have a profit focus and blah, blah, blah. But it does need to be sustainable. This is not a hippie universe where everyone works for free. Sustainability is absolutely essential. It's got to have a model for paying for itself and paying for people to work on things. The technology should not disappear if one company does. If we rely on one company and the board of that company or whatever to, to keep something going, um, and even if it's a government, uh, that's not long term, right? That company, as you well know, will, can just disappear. Um, and so, as so many do, and that's, that's the nature of, of the game. But it's very, it's very sad if we've put a lot of effort building an infrastructure based on that company and that company disappears and the infrastructure has to be changed. It should focus on standards. Open technology should, if not uh, follow standards, should set standards, should become standards. And uh, I'll show you some examples. Look at, here are some typical, in the, in the software world of the internet, and if you're on Wi-Fi um, or any internet, you are depending on a lot of open source software. 70% of web servers use Unix and other types of servers would be even higher so that the sort of servers that aren't serving web pages but are doing all the other work of the internet, much higher percentages of those would be Unix, which is an open source operating system. 80% of web servers use PHP as their language, an open source uh, scripting language. The phones we're all using are based on open source software. Uh, Git is a language used by most developers now, developed by Linus Torvalds, an open source system. 
databases, all the high-tech stuff that runs clusters, that runs Amazon, that runs all that cloud infrastructure, a lot of it is open source. Most of the internet is run on open source already. It's just that open source doesn't tend to have the marketing budget to go and tell you about it all the time. So we've got to think about long-term sustainability of this open technology. And if we're starting with things at the bottom, I think sustainability moves all the way up. If you have a sustainable technology in your devices and on the internet, and you have sustainable applications and, and infrastructure for, uh, for connecting people and building education processes, it naturally lends itself to more sustainability all the way up, to the sustainability of education institutions or programs or curriculums. And that's where it gets to the open education part. I want to talk about, because I've got really limited time and I really would love to talk to you for an hour and have a, a far more entertaining talk, but I've, I, I'm so passionate about this and I'm, this is really critical and I want to just get across a couple of the things that we're doing um, uh, as we go forward that address the key problems to support uh, a more open education infrastructure and knowledge around the world. So here's, we're doing a lot of things. Here are four big ones. The four big things that I want to talk about, talk about today um, that we've been working on. So Moodle apps, I want to talk about Moodle Net, our Moodle Educator Certification and conferences that we're doing. So you may not be aware, because even if you use Moodle, I've noticed a lot of people are not aware that we have a Moodle app. It's a free open source app. It has 100% functionality for students, which is far better than I think a lot of other uh, LMSs can say. Um, obviously, it lets things work on your mobile device. Uh, it has the ability to download whole courses onto the device. This is super critical for uh, when you have third world internet conditions such as OEB. Um, and uh, it, it, it enables internet technology to reach in more parts of the world and be more useful. So we've, we've got lots and lots of examples of people using Moodle. Uh, I'll just tell you one at random uh, in Syria. Uh, recently, uh, during some of a lot of this crisis, there are groups working there who have Moodle on phones connected to projectors, and they're projecting courses on tents, right? And uh, when they get internet, they can update and and uh, and synchronise things together, but they can work offline a lot of the time. Another good thing about the app is that it enables the website Moodle to start reaching right into your pocket, and that enables better education processes because, as you know, we all have brains. And this lump of meat operates best when it gets a lot of tight feedback loops. If you do something, you get feedback, that's when learning happens. If you submit an assignment and you hear about it a week later, well, you know, you've moved on. Your brain's moved on. That feedback may not be so effective. But if I say a word wrong, a foreign language, uh, a word in a foreign language, I say it wrong, and the person I'm talking to immediately corrects me, those synapses are firing, I can learn how to say that better immediately. Right? So this is, this is stuff that's not going to change as technology changes. This is this technology we're stuck with for a while. So if you have an app, you're able to use that uh, immediacy much better as an educator. And the tools in your LMS are able to uh, have tighter loops. That's essential. Um, that's been misused by the Facebooks of this world uh, to you know, get people into a kind of Pavlovian uh, situation of you know, responding to alerts and being draw sucked back into meaningless activities. But let's use that, that force for good. Uh, so this app is on uh, the stores. It looks good. 
teachers uh, like it, the students love it, it's, it's really very good. And we've just, uh, this year, made it much, much easier for third-party developers to add their bits into the app. So the app can really, truly cover the 100% of the functionality of the site, even if you've customized it. Okay. So we have uh, a desktop app as well. It runs on laptops and tablets. And we have a branded version. This is sustainability. If, if you want to have one that looks like your university, you can get one from us as well. Second thing I want to talk about is Moodle.net. This is very, very exciting to me. I encourage you to go to this address, moodle.com slash moodle.net. Uh, this is a new open social media platform that we are building as a, as a federated system. It's not a centralized thing. It's something where you can have nodes. Anybody can run a node, be part of the network. It's about professional development of educators, teachers finding other teachers who are doing the same subject in the same language. And in that group, collaboratively curating resources for each other. So the next person who comes along has a lot of quality stuff to work with. Uh, it's mobile first for, the, for users. So it's something you can browse instead of browsing Facebook. And it's connected to the LMS. It's something very, very new. Uh, the first betas will be launched in January, and you're very welcome to take part. Uh, Learn Moodle is a, a, the Moodle Educator Certificate. This is a new curriculum we've been developing for a year. It's based on the DigComp Edu uh, competency framework, a European framework. And it's uh, 22 competencies. It's not just about how to use Moodle. It's about the entire thing around being an online educator. And we're pushing that out and making it part of lots of different projects to try and improve uh, how people are using stuff. And the last thing I want to talk about is the conferences we're doing. We have around 20 or so uh, official Moodle moots, as we call them, happening around the world. And uh, I don't go to all of them, but they're, they're just ways for our, um, our users to get together and share best practice and learn from each other. Uh, this is one that happened recently in uh, Belgium, in Brussels. It's a typical uh, Moodle mood. But I want to end with this last thing. This is a new initiative because I feel that in this space, um, we don't hear enough collaboration between the people who are interested in open education technology. And so I'm creating a space. We're creating a space here. It's in Barcelona next November. 20 to 22. If you're interested in that, please pencil it into your diaries. It's going to be an annual conference. We want the leaders and developers of open education software to talk at a C-level uh, strategy level, but also developers to work on integrations and to, to basically make an open education platform with all the pieces needed. It's a university in a box, a school in a box, right, that's completely open. Uh, and we want to work with development organizations there as well. So finally, I just want to say this should be our goal, right? All of us, we should be here focused on this in some way, in some small part or a large part. If we can create that, you know, this is what's not just uh, nice to have, but according to the UN, this is how we have a sustainable planet. It's actually critical. And I think open education is a really huge part of that. So um, I'll end there. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Martin. That's excellent. You were in time. We have one minute left. If anybody has an urgent uh, question, uh, <laughs> because uh, uh, does somebody have a mi microphone that can be taken to? While you get the microphone to him yeah, or the, the, yell it out. Um, there is, we have a Moodle booth and I'm going to be hanging out there for the next couple of days. So if you want to come and find me, come yeah. down there. It's oh. a D40, I think. Yeah, I was going to right. suggest that you can find him uh, in yep. the coffee break or lunch break as well. One question there. Hello, I'm uh, hello Martin. Thank you for your conference. I'm Cyril Bedell. I'm with Edu now. We're a Moodle partner. And I would like you to tell the audience what a Moodle partner provides to the community. Yes, so the, our main sustainability model is 
uh, our Moodle partner network, 80 companies um, that are around the world doing the services. They do support, hosting, consulting, training. Anytime you need to call someone for some help around Moodle, call a Moodle partner. 10% uh, of what you give them comes to the Moodle project. And that's our, uh, the major part of our sustainability. Thank you for that. Thank you again. All right, Martin. thank you. Thank you. Um,